Thanks for joining us this afternoon. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizens-based forum where we look at issues of interest to the Tri-Cities. I'd like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for making these interviews possible. And I'd also like, before we start, to acknowledge that this interview is taking place today on the, tra on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Quiquitlam First Nations. And we thank the Quiquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and care for the waters and all that lies above and below. So this afternoon I am joined by Steve Milani, who is taking a run for Port Moody Mayor. So thank you so much for joining us today, Steve. Thank you, Nancy. It's a pleasure to be here. I was wondering if we could maybe start with, um, just give us a little bit of a background, a little bit of a sense of who you are and why you're taking this run for Mayor. Sure. Yeah, I'm a longtime resident of Moody Centre lived there for over 24 years now and I've always been an active member from starting as a director with the Moody Centre Community Association and kind of followed the growth of Port Moody for that entire length of time. I spoke up at meetings with regards to bringing McBarge here. I've seen all the drawings when they wanted to bring light rail along St. John's and so I've always been intrigued and fascinated by local government and I wanted to pursue that. Well, that sounds um, like you've got a, a good background on sort of where Port Moody has sort of come from. You have um, been a city councillor in this last term, um, and I was wondering, can you talk a little bit, tell us your role as city councillor, what were some of your main accomplishments there, and, and maybe some of the things that you're most proud of accomplishing? Sure. Well, I think the top one has to be the unification and protection of Burt Flynn Park. Mm -hmm. That was massive and it's, it's such an incredible space for people to connect with nature and it's, it just adds to, to the quality of life in Port Moody and helps with the mental health issues that people are experiencing more and more these days just to get out and, and be at one with nature and that was a huge accomplishment so I'm really happy that we were able to pull that off. It was it was close and it was uh, quite a fight, but we got it done, so that is definitely um, top of the list. Uh, other accomplishments and highlights, I would have to say that, I guess I could kind of go chrono chronologically mm -hmm. as well. Sure, you know, if you can tell us a few things that sure. happened to your term, I would be really interested in hearing. Yes, thanks. Uh, another one is actually tackling the construction noise bylaw. Okay. And that became quite an issue, especially during COVID, when more and more people had to stay at home and, and work from home. And we would receive, or council I should say, as we, would receive emails from frustrated uh, residents of just talking about all this noise they had to put up with. We even received MP3 recordings with all of the windows closed and you could hear the noise coming in. So I said, we've got to look at this. So what I did, I wrote a report, brought it to council, and I was reasonable in the approach and I compared municipalities and I actually talked to developers as well to get their opinion on it because I, you don't want to put them in a bad situation uh, with drawing out the length of a project, say. Right. So I spoke with them and at first I proposed seven, or sorry, I guess I should say the existing uh, bylaw. So it was 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday. So what I was able to accomplish was 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So it shaved one hour off in the evening where people could enjoy the peace and quiet. Um, again, you know, I was trying to be reasonable with my approach. With Saturdays, I was trying to hit it hard at 9 to 5. So going from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. and trimming it down to 9 to 5. However, I, I understood that it would be difficult for the workforce to get a full day in since that's eight hours total. So I decided to go with 9 to 6. Right. And uh, that seemed to go over well with the development community members that I spoke with. So what I did, uh, the staff report came back from council with the rec recommendation was not to do anything. So, okay. so I said, no, I'm going to move 
that we go with the 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday and 9 to 6 on Saturdays. And I did receive support, the unanimous support from the rest of council. There were some questions as to if it would slow projects down and this and that, so I reassured everyone that I had done the research and, and there, was, there were no concerns from those that I spoke with in the development community. So I, I consider that a huge win for, again, the quality of life for Port Moody residents and just the mental health issue because there's so much noise in, in this world now. Yeah, and I think you bring up a couple of really good um, points and they both kind of um, lean towards mental wellness or mental health. And when we're talking about living in a city and it's very noisy, you've talked already about the importance of green space and parks, and then also about having a community where, you know, you have those quiet times and, and a respectful um, sort of parameters put around it. So it sounds like you've taken a pragmatic approach and that you're also trying to look at a balance between allowing work to go ahead, but still, on the other hand, respecting citizens and, and the need to have that space and that, that, those quiet times. Sure. I think uh, one of the other more recent accomplishments was taking on the restoration of Cal Centre. Uh, it's known as TARP Centre in the Moody Centre hood. You can, it's covered in tarps and you can lit literally walk around the back of the building, reach into the wall and pull out insulation. So it was in dire need of some attention. And the problem was that its maintenance kept getting deferred by previous councils. And it, it had to be addressed now because there, it was only a matter of time before it would be probably co condemned actually. And then with no plans to replace it. Can you tell us a little bit about Kyle Center? What goes on at Kyle Center? That's, that's very interesting because a lot of people think that not much goes on there. But it's just a host of uh, mainly seniors programming goes on there. So everything from Tai Chi to ballroom dancing and uh, other exercise programs. There's a snooker room, which is very popular. And I had snooker room uh, participants contact me about saving Kyle as well. And we have the Rock and Gem Club, which has been there since the beginning. And so a lot of great community groups, a lot of great memories from the, from the community. And, you know, the thing about this, it, sure, it's not what would normally be qualified as a heritage building, right. but it is part of Port Moody's heritage, and we should respect that. And it's 10,000 square feet. And right now we're working towards, um, you know, buildings that are sustainable and environmentally friendly. Well, that building has elements of mass timber in it with its massive beam network and they're all exposed, beautiful beams. And it has uh, electric heat as well, which is, as you know, that's the way to go, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it even has a computer controlled uh, air system filtration or ventilation system which is controlled at City Hall. So it's, it's a wonderful building. It's built very well. All of the reports came through saying, and I can pretty much quote, they said, if this building is maintained as per what's recommended, it could go, this building can go on to service the community indefinitely. So there's nothing wrong with it. And so to hear other councillors say, oh yeah, we know from the information that it's ready to push down, that information is inaccurate. Okay, it's interesting. I just have to say, my husband is part of that snooker club, and they were all very excited to hear that, um, that, that snooker would be carrying on. So for Kyle Center, now you were saying that um, there are some elements right now that it, it makes it a, a very environmentally sustainable building. How will it change once it's renovated? Like, what, what are the changes that you're going to see there? The first thing that will be done, it's different phases, and we've approved the first phase, so that'll be a complete envelope replacement. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll explain what that is. So it's basically the exterior siding, all of the windows, all of the exterior doors, all of the roof, the flat roof and the, the gabled roof lines, right. and also all of the skylights. So it's to button it up and protect it from the elements. So once that's done, we'll have a building that is far more efficient, so it'll be even greener than it is now. 
Okay. And is there any thought of expanding programs there? Will it be a bigger building than it is now, or will it stay in the same footprint? That's a good question. The footprint will not change at all. However, one of the recommendations that I made, all of which were passed, so I'm very excited about that, mm. uh, one of the recommendations was to extend the roof lines out to protect the siding so we don't run into the same issue again. Oh, okay, so changing the design a little bit. To yes, just by, yeah. by implementing roof overhangs, something that's very simple and straightforward. And the other one was, I examined the structure and uh, brought along an experienced builder as well to check it out. And I had an idea to, when we, when we peeled off all the exterior siding, to just put a beam in, just a header, which is the same as any garage door header, and just put that in and then button it back up, put the siding right over top. Okay. And so in the future, if, and that's an if, it was to be expanded, it could be easily accessed without causing any damage to mm -hmm. the work that's already been done. So thinking to the future exactly. a little bit. Now, you had mentioned mass timber, and I know we've talked before about mass timber. How is that incorporated into Kyle Centre, and will there be more of that incorporated in once the renovations are done? Well, I don't think there will be more okay. incorporated. Uh, the elements that exist now would be the the glue lamb beams and, and that type of thing, which are exposed, beautiful to look right. at. and. Uh, the reports say, or many reports have been done, where that exposed wood mm -hmm. gives a real a good feeling to people when they're in the building because they feel a little bit more in touch with nature. That's true. I think it's always a very warm mm -hmm. atmosphere if, if there's um, wood inside a building. So exactly. it's nice that, you know, you're thinking about that as well. So, um, And we got the go-ahead. So everything passed with all the amendments. So I, And they even agreed to make it a priority one. That's great news for residents of Port Moody Very and exciting. for everybody who, who uses Kyle Center there. Um, I guess, can we maybe talk a little bit now about the future? So you're taking a run for mayor, and can you give us just a, a quick sense of how that might change the way that you work or, or change your role um, compared, like, city councillor to mayor? What's going to change for you? Well, you know, I'm that boots on the ground guy that talks to all the residents and that's how I know what to bring forward. And, and I introduce myself to the new business owners in the area as well. So I don't think that's going to change. Okay. I still will be that guy, that personable guy who's in touch with everyone and, and relay that information back to City Hall. Right. So in that way, it, it won't change. So you still have sort of that connection with the community and an open door um, An open door policy for sure, and I yeah. think it has to be that way. Uh, a mayor should be approachable mm -hmm. and in touch with the needs of the community, and they should bring that forward and, and be present in a very positive way. Right. Can you share with us, what, um, just very briefly, what your top three, pri two or three priorities are, and then we'll have a chance to go back and, and talk about each one in a, a little bit more depth. You're heading me off before I get ahead of myself and <laughs> go into the weeds, sure. Um, well, I think... Got to keep you on track here. There's so much to cover and so much that we want to know about. For sure. I, I think the number one priority has to be sticking to the official community plan. Okay. You know, and I could go off in the weeds on this with like Woodland Park and, and that type of thing, which nothing like that was ever imagined. And so what is Woodland Park? Well, that's where they are removing the townhouses, the 200 townhomes there, and they're replacing it with just over 2,200 units. So it's, so it's, it's a massive development that's going on up the hill. A lot of densification happening yes. there. Yes, it is. So, and that wasn't, it wasn't ever imagined. So I, in a way that it wasn't on the OCP, it actually contributed to the project being financially viable. Because in the other mm -hmm. areas where they're designated with higher density, right. the land values skyrocket. And in this case, oh, that's interesting. it wasn't identified. So it wasn't kind of on the radar. Exactly. So oh. they were able to purchase it at like a townhome zoned rate right. and then come back with this uh, massive project which does include a large component of affordable housing in a partnership with BC Housing. So with that project not being part of the official community plan, mm -hmm. the neighborhood really had no idea what was coming.
Right. And so to introduce that kind of density to that existing residential area of mainly single family homes other than this development, you know, was quite a shock. And I, I had an issue with the fact that the city did not perform any community consultation. So the developer did, but not the city. So oh, to me, okay. I, I, that didn't sit well right. with me. And, uh, and then the traffic plan of introducing that many people, I was not a fan of that either. And because of that, uh, those things, I did not end up supporting the project. I was all for the affordable housing component but there were just too many uh, things that didn't sit well with me. So is it you think the developer could do better, offer more, or you were just saying no outright to the project? Well, mainly because of, you know, the, uh, the neighbourhood wasn't consulted properly right. in the process, and, and that's just not the way we should do things. Okay, so to go right back to the first step, the first step is to do the consultation exactly. and to find out from the community and the residents and to communicate so before any of those other things went forward. Yes, communication is key. You mm -hmm. know, and uh, the developer did work at improving the development application, but it was massive. Right. You know, and I did stand up uh, to try to get community amenity contributions back because staff's advice in the report was that they wouldn't have to pay over $6 million in CACs. What are CACs? That's the Community Amenity Contribution. So okay. it goes towards helping us build the amenities, the facilities that we need to support this additional population increase. Okay, so the CACs goes money that the developer gives to the city to build the amenities that are needed exactly. to go, oh, okay. So, and, uh, and so what I did was I spoke against them not paying it and uh, that kind of filtered through and I believe, even though the vote passed that day, with them not having to pay the over $6 million, I think they were a little worried about the next vote coming. Okay. So they actually came back at the next meeting and coughed up $6.7 million mm. in CACs. So if you don't speak up and make a case for it, you're never going to get it. Right. So maybe it came as a little bit of a surprise to the developer as well yeah. that, you know, they were going to be asked for this. So... Now they're prepared and, and hopefully, um, you know, can do even better next time. Exactly. So yeah. I, I, I'm always pushing for more on behalf mm -hmm. of the residents. And uh, I think that's very important. That's something that we're elected to do. And that's something that we should consistently be doing. Right. So, and that's, it all relates back to sticking to the official community plan, of which that was not a part. Right. So now, I, yes, I, I can see where see how that, ties that is a problem, yes. Yeah, and same as uh, the, the infamous Coronation Park proposal, mm -hmm. which council was accused of moving the goalposts, but the problem was they brought us a project that n was never within the goalposts. They brought us a project that was far outside of the goalposts. Okay. So there was a lot of issues with that. It's, it's denser than... Suterbrook and Newport Village combined, you know, and between that fact and the fact that there is zero affordability or a zero affordability component promised, mm -hmm. right. they say something could happen if they find a partner, but there is nothing promised as so far as affordability. When you say affordability, are you talking about below market housing or? Exactly. Like, okay. uh, well, there's a, there's all types of affordability, right? But below market housing is, is the important one. And other aspects of, um, of affordability components. I'm a huge fan of rent to own and things like right. that as well. So people can, as they say, get some skin in the game. Right. So between the fact that there's no affordable component and then myself, the mayor, Councillor Madsen, requested a traffic study so we could see how that terrible intersection of Ioko and St. John's, how it would be affected. Well, the other councillors voted it down, so we didn't have that data to be able to, to make a, a good informed decision. So, you know, it's just, there were, there were so many elements to that, mm -hmm. that project that didn't sit well with me. And the fact that they're clear cutting 14.88 acres uh, and digging out basically the side of the mountain to facilitate this, we're lo losing a massive part of our tree canopy. 
in that project. And now that you brought up tree canopy, can we talk a little bit about that? Like, why is it important to keep that tree canopy? Um, we know that there's going to be development throughout the city, um, and we, we do see trees coming down. Why do you think it's a problem to take those trees down? Well, it contributes to the heat dome effect, and we have to maintain what we have, mm -hmm. and, and to take those trees, which the neighborhood is roughly 50 years old, so even if they're not technically old growth trees, they're well established. Right. And to just mow down the entire neighborhood, it, it absolutely does not make any sense. Right. And I think we've seen how important trees are. You mentioned the heat dome and, and you know, things are heating up in our cities. Um, we also know during COVID, uh, people need to get out and we need our green space, we need our trees. and, and beyond all the ecological services that they provide. So uh, that's, I, w I wonder if we can maybe just go a little bit further down the tree path. Do we have enough park space and amenities in Port Moody for, to meet the needs of the residents? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we can always use more green space, more park space for people to get in touch with nature. And again, that relates to the whole mental health, the thing about, about being close to nature and what it does for you. But I think we need more green space. The trouble is where we're going to get it. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at these developments that are coming forward and make sure that they do incorporate a good portion of green space in their proposals. And the existing green space that we have, we have to look at those existing parks, neighborhood parks, and see if they're meeting the needs of the community around them. For example, Cal Park, right behind Cal Center, that little strip of green. Uh, well, actually, it's not even Cal Park. Cal Park is kind of on the other side of the street. But this is the little strip right behind Cal Center, or in front of it, beside it, however you want to look at it. And that strip was recently re-outfitted with ping pong tables and uh, uh, sail, shade, sail, sail shade. Uh, one of those sails to provide shade. Oh, I see. Okay, like a shade sail. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? It's like shade I know sail what you mean or now. sail shade. Yeah. Yes. So that was installed as well, and there were a num number of other components. There's a badminton net as well, and uh, just a lot of fun things. And now that one kind of deserted little strip of, of grass is a super active community space. Ah. You can go by there any time and there's always people there. So sometimes so. getting a little creative with the spaces that we already have that are maybe underutilized. Exactly. Um, so uh, yeah, there's always opportunities, I, I think. Um, review and update. Yes, review and update. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess one other thing that I just wanted to um, touch on a little bit is something that we always talk about in our We've Got Issues interviews and it's talking about respectful workplace and you have experience on Port Moody City Council as a counsellor and again I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how your role might change a little bit when you become mayor in promoting a, a safe and, and healthy workspace and also what some of your experiences have been up to date as far as your contribution to um, maintaining a, a healthy workspace. Sure. Uh, you might have heard it said that I'm the no drama guy. So I don't like to participate in the, the nattering that goes on at right. the council table. I like to stick to the work in front of me, um, look at the facts, um, try to come to a logical decision based on the facts and the input from the community and our professional staff. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's really a reason to get into uh, personal attacks and, and things of that nature. So what I would be bringing is just a, a super positive, drama-free approach. I'm, I'm approachable. Uh, I j people consider me to be in a good mood. Uh, most of the time or all of the time and that's just how I l like to live my life. So I think that bringing a positive approach to the council table is something that people are looking for. They've seen enough drama and so let's just move forward in a more positive, more constructive, more collaborative way. Okay, so it's, it's nice to hear um, the positivity um, as far as your approach goes. 
And then I was wondering, there's been a lot of talk lately about installing an integrity commissioner um, at the provincial level to have provincial oversight so that when there are those issues that can't be resolved around the uh, council table, that there is that sort of third body, body oversight to um, help resolve those and, and to help work mm -hmm. through those. Is that something that you would support? I have no issue with that. I mean, Port Moody has its own code of conduct. And to be quite frank, I see members of council in breach of it quite consistently. Okay. Um, you know, and everyone just kind of lets it slide. So, mm -hmm. but I think if there's a, a higher level that is overseeing that, I don't think it's a bad thing. Okay. I think then you have more of a neutral it would third be an party. unbiased third exactly. party who can and deal with those issues, right? Sometimes just takes the, the heat away from it because I think there's a lot of passionate people on council and sometimes, you know, they want to do the right thing, but um, we're approaching it from so many different angles that exactly. uh, sometimes just to be able to step back um, is not a bad thing. So, Steve, you've been talking about the OCP and the importance of, of sticking with the OCP. Mm -hmm. Are there any other thoughts on that? Yeah, most definitely. One of the most important things is that we stick to our agreed to growth target with Metro Vancouver, which is 50,000 residents by 2041. And taking into consideration the projects such as Coronation Park and Woodland Park that have already been passed at approximately 5,000 residents each and everything else we have on the table, we're already set to exceed that at about 52,000. So if we add in other projects like the TOD, Transit Oriented Development Area, and Flavel Oceanfront, um, to name a couple, will be over 70,000 and will far exceed, will basically double our population. So sticking to the growth target is extremely important. Okay. So we have a specific worth, uh, growth target and you're saying that if all these other developments are approved and go through that we're basically overstepping the growth target by a significant amount and we'll have twice the population that we have now in Port Moody. That's correct and okay. these numbers can be found on the Port Moody's, uh, on the City of Port Moody's development page. So it's, these numbers aren't coming out of thin air as some would like you to believe. Okay. And the cost of growth is massive. So right now we're already behind and we have to catch up. And uh, But if we go to say 70,000 people, we'll be looking at another 200 million in infrastructure, in amenities and, okay, and so infrastructure significant. to support. It's more than significant, yeah. and that doesn't include the cost of uh, the purchase of park space, which would bring us over 400,000. Right. So can you tell us about um, some of your other priorities? Definitely. Um, the next, uh, one of the other priorities that would be massive for me is, is expanding the green space that we have at Rocky Point Park to accommodate this future growth. So the growth always ties into everything, right. and, and that would be one of them. I think that we need a meaningful expansion to Rocky Point Park along the shoreline. So I'm not saying no to development there. Right. Uh, what that development would look like, I'm not 100% sure, as we haven't received back the Survey 3 results yet to see what the residents think. Okay, so there is public consultation right now going on about um, the fate of that parcel of land, whether it goes as an extension of Rocky Point Park or whether it will go for developments? Yes, exactly. Different neighbors, different neighborhoods are being reviewed uh, and community input is being given and then that'll all be coming back to council so we'll be able to make informed decisions in how we want to adjust the OCP in the new vision. So and that's uh, the park space is, uh, is one of them. Right. So we'll wait and see what the public input is back on that and exactly. we may end up with a, a bigger park there. We'll have to see. That would be lovely. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> and then did you want to talk about your third priority a little bit? Sure. Yeah, the third priority, priority sorry, would be to um, improve Port Moody's business tax base. So right now, okay. for example, the TOD, the Transit Oriented Development Area around Moody Station, is slated for 12 towers, that's the active application, and we'll be bringing in approximately six to 7,000 residents there. So there's a huge focus on a residential component and there's a uh, far less focus on business. 
And uh, I think we need to flip that around oh, and put the focus on okay. business and definitely incorporate residential into right. the mix because we want to create a complete walkable community there. And uh, something like a grocery store would be most appreciated. I know mm -hmm. living in Moody Centre that myself and everyone else who resides there has been waiting forever for a grocery store within walking distance. Right. So that would be appreciated. But I think we need to improve the business situation. What we're doing now is we're using the SkyTrain to take everyone out of the city to go to work. Right. So what we should be doing is using the SkyTrain and the West Coast Express to bring people into the city to work, to build... So you're going to reverse that Exactly. Flow. Okay. Build a business tax base which really makes a difference. Um, as residential taxes don't really give us much extra in the mix. It's right. mostly cost recovery on things like sewer, water, and that type of thing collecting on behalf of the school board and but we need to build that business tax base let's get some good anchor tenants in there we have mm -hmm. interest from um, say SFU Cap College and and uh, these types of institutions to create campuses but we don't have any place to put to put them oh, so excellent. if we can build on that I think that is is the future of Port Moody to create a truly walkable community right. and not simply uh, have a sea of concrete, high-rise residential towers turning into turning us into, as you mentioned, the bedroom community. Steve, I would just like to say thank you so much. It looks like our time has come to a close here. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to come and, and talk to us today. And I'm going to wish you all the very best in your campaign. And October 15th will come up quickly. Great. So, Thanks so much, Nancy. Uh, I enjoyed the interview once again. So thanks, and I hope that we will have an opportunity to talk again soon. So thank you for watching We've Got Issues, and also we extend our thanks to Tri-Cities Community TV. Today our um, interview was with Steve Malani, who is running for Port Moody Mayor. Thank you. Thank you.